Okay, we're recording. Yep. So we we're live. Over. All right, great, thanks. Um, all right, let me just mention one once more that it's um, important to ask questions. Um, and in particular, the, the, probably the best kind of question is, I don't understand what you're doing. You know, that part of the blackboard. Um, because then, uh, you know, I can, I know that I have to clarify that. Um, uh, and that's a nice seat right there. Is it allowed? Well, I don't have a desk yeah, sure. though. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Um, anyway, you see, I can't, I mean, you know, ideally I could, I would or could, but in reality, I can't know what you don't know. I'm really not good at reading minds. In fact, my wife says that I'm not perceptive at all. <laughs> um, and it's true that we've been married more than 30 years, and I don't understand the damn thing about her. Um, so, uh, so um, now one thing that I did notice when I was reading over my notes last night or the night before um, was that I had described the Lorentz notation really quickly. And I remember when I was a graduate student, I was puzzled as hell by it. So let me just say it again. D phi squared, what is it? Well, it's basic, it's, it's actually in the simplest terms, it's just it just would be that if phi is a simply a function of space time or as we say a field this is a dot time group. and another way of saying it is partial phi partial t squared minus rad phi squared another way of saying it is partial phi partial x zero in units where c is 1, x is x0, and then I might as well say x, y, z, or more sensibly, x0, x1, x2, x3. So we're talking flat space, and upper indices mean that it is whatever it is without any, um, without any, uh, minus signs. On the other hand, um, so this is essentially x upper. So that's a, a sort of mixed notation. Minus, uh, again, just grad, well, minus some uh, say i equals 1 to 3 partial phi partial x i squared. And now what we what we might do is is use this uh, notation that this is a to a b partial phi partial x a partial b, partial x b, where a to a b of course is it's um, one minus one minus one minus one. So I made things a little more explicit there. And another way of writing this, in fact, this is the way I wrote it on Monday. I said this was dA phi, dB phi. So in other words, dA is partial, partial x of a. And as usual in relativity, d over a is a to a b, d lower b summed over b from 0 to 3. And so d0 is, uh, no, we've got this. That's, my, that's what I use. But um, z uses the opposite metric. So he has um, rad, well, has d0 equals d0 and 
di equals minus di. And this is the di is the ordinary derivative. It's partial, partial x i. And finally, x lower a, if you have to deal with it sometime, is going to be um, uh, x0 minus x1 minus x2 minus x3. And another way of writing it is x0, uh, x0, x1, x2, x3. All right, so I, I, I'm, so that's the notation that uh, z uses. Now, in, in these, I put some chap PDFs and some chapters in my book on the web page, and in that case, um, I use the other metric. Finley also uses the other metric. It's a, um, the other metric has one minus sign instead of three, and that, you know, you think would be an advantage. But um, metric, the, these two choices for metric, unfortunately, are equally common. If one were more common than the others, then then uh, people would switch to the one that really was approximately universal. But unfortunately, they're almost equally popular. Let's see, you had some question that you were promising to ask in this class, right? But uh, I've really forgotten. Out. Huh? I was just trying to figure out what was going on. In, uh, Trying to, I was trying to understand how you, what you were talking about, why there was this multiplication or, yeah, multiplication and an integral, and uh, I'm not really even sure what. All right, so, let me try to get back to that then. Um, What we saw last time was the qj plus 1 e to the minus i p squared over 2m some dt qj. Whoa. We saw that as an, uh, an integral, and we computed it as and of course I'm in units where h bar and c equals 1 minus i m. Occasionally I put in the h bars. But by no means all the time. Well. Okay, that's what we got, and we agreed to call this q dot, and so this is minus i m over 2 pi dt, e to the i m over 2, q dot squared. Okay, so that's the picture. And now what we're trying to do is we're trying to say the qf, by the way, as I tell, I always remind my students that if I'm lecturing with the left hand up, then I'm reading the notes, and you can be sure that most of my, what I'm writing is, is accurate. When the left hand is down, then I'm not holding my notes, and the typo rate goes up sharply. Okay, so you need to worry about that. Yeah? So, um, does the, the difference, the only, is it true that the only difference between this notation of superscript and subscript is the, the metric? Right, the minus sign on the space component. Minus sign. Yeah, it's raising and lowering indices. Okay. Thanks. By the way, about answering, asking questions. Um, I used to think that some that students didn't ask questions because they were afraid that the professors would learn, find out how little they know. Actually, we know how little we know. Um, I, I, that was meant to be a joke rather than a true statement. Um, and certainly not an insult. 
Um, however, one of, a couple of years ago, one of the students told me that the reason they're afraid, one of the reasons they're afraid, students are afraid to ask questions is that if they do ask questions that that that's seem to reveal lack of understanding or lack of background, that their peers, their fellow students, will have less regard for them or will make fun of them and so forth. And that's really not good. So, you know, so let me just urge you, don't make fun of your fellow students first. And then secondly, um, I see somebody's laughing in the background. I'm glad that laughter is a good thing. Um, anyway, um, and also you never know who is going to be um, going to be turn out going to turn out to be a great physicist, or a great scientist, or a great writer, or whatever. Um, abilities. Uh, people mature intellectually at different ages. People have different advantages. Um, and so forth, and so somebody can say perfectly stupid things um, at one point and then keep doing things later. Or the reverse, that happens also. Um, uh, so, it's, you, you, you really never know who's going to do really well, and what the hell, I mean, everybody here is smart, so, so there's no point in is there a question? Yeah. So I understand this is stuck in the left. That's I had some notation. Simple enough. I was wondering where exactly are we going with this right Well, I I want you to understand path integrals because they become more and more important in um, certainly in quantum field theory, also in things more advanced than quantum field theory. And also the field of the, the applications of quantum mechanics, of quantum, I'm sorry, path integrals have expanded horizontally into other fields. I've even seen them used in biophysics where you have some uh, uh, polymer and you want to uh, compute the average length of the polymer or the average uh, distance, the end of the polymer would be from the beginning of the polymer. And so what you do is you path integrate over all possible shapes of the polymer. Right. So it's gotten extremely broad, and they're even used in finance. Um, I used to say that in order to tempt people to study path integrals, but since um, these people doing finance have brought about a worldwide depression or recession, um, it no longer seems like such an attractive field. But it's, so it's just so that you learn about path integrals. So essentially this stuff is, um, you're introducing us to path integrals in the context of quantum mechanics, is that the idea? First in terms of quantum mechanics, and then we're going to generalize to quantum field theory. Right. The generalization of, with many things, the first step is difficult, is next, the generalization is easy. And in, that, in this case, we do quantum mechanics first, and then quantum field theory. And the quantum field theory is a simple generalization of the quantum mechanics. So that's the idea. Um, I, I, I may be going too slowly for some of you, um, but I, uh, I hope I'm not going too fast. So what do we have then? We have e to the minus i h t q i is then uh, something like uh, q f e to the minus i h d t and then so some q n, q n or maybe n minus 1, I'm not keeping track. dot, 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 all the way down to, uh, I don't remember whether it's Q1 or Q0, let me say Q1, maybe I'll make it Q0. So it looks like this, all right? And then each of these is that. 
But when we insert these complete sets of states, we have to integrate all, over all of them. So we have to integrate over um, all of these uh, product dq uh, j, say, j equals 0 to n, the way I've written it, but I think um, the notes have n minus 1, actually. So this is, the, this is the expression, and so what this is then is it's a product, uh, let us say, k equals 1 to n minus 1, to actually use my notes then, and it would be um, minus i m over 2 pi dt, and I'm sort of collapsing this to the one half dqk and then e to the i summation on j uh, m over 2 and this is if we call this we can call this say qj dot squared dt and so all together then what we say is that this is an integral e to the i integral of m over 2 q dot squared dt dq of t. So I'm absorbing all these square roots and integrals into one symbol dq of t. And I think one way of, one thing that I'm toying with doing, this is a, something that I haven't yet done, um, probably exists somewhere in the literature, but uh, one could keep this form and do these integrals explicitly either for the free case or for a more complicated case. And um, if it's a problem that's quadratic, then one can re-express that as a, a multiple integral. And then that, if that's an exactly doable multiple integral, it'd be effectively some square root of a determinant. And um, that might that might shed more light on this, but I haven't worked that out in detail, so let me leave that. So, in other words, we have to integrate over all possible paths, and so it was like in the original picture where you have a, um, a possibility of a particle going from some qi to some qf, and it can, you integrate over all paths. And that means that you really integrate over all of these all of these cubes, and you time slice, and you make as many time slices as possible, and then the exponent is this thing here. All right. This, I hope that's actually since you sort of asked the question, here's another chocolate. Wow. Okay, any other questions? Yeah. So, um, if, so if this is like the best possible path, then this uh, QF e to the IHT on QI, that'll be one, right? So that, how does that tell you? Well, uh, I, 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 I guess you're, you're pointing at something that's true, but I, what I heard wasn't the way I would have said it. Um, I'm going to today get to the approximation where uh, you approximate this with uh, e to the i, the classical action. Okay. So I'll, I'll get to that. That's the main. I don't know if you guys are curious or hungry. But <laughs> <laughs> um, do some of the paths have a negative amplitude? To well, these are amplitude. All these amplitudes are complex numbers. Okay. So, so yeah, some of them are negative. All right, now let me see where I was. The amplitudes themselves present some sort of 
probability of what? Did the amplitude of cells present a um, probability of the particle proceeding down that path? Well, y yes, yes. I mean, the, in other words, the algebraic uh, squared of this gives you the probability that it goes from QI to QF in time t. So, who oh, sorry. Um, yeah. So, how do I understand the Q is a function of T? Sorry, I don't know. The pitch was low. So, uh, Q is a function of T? Yes. Can you explain that? Q is a function of T, yes. So, does that mean? Uh, in each different time, so the particle have a different parts. Yeah, well, let me let me just do it the way. Uh, let's put it this way: we have here q. Here we have say slice j plus one, slice j, slice j minus one, and I probably should have done it this way: j minus one, j j plus one, because t is going this way normally. And you have maybe qj minus 1 is here, qj is there, qj plus 1 is here, but you have to integrate over all of these. And so the, the, this is one path, but as you integrate over the qj's, uh, they go up and down, and you integrate over all paths eventually. j minus 2. So you integrate over all of them. And all right, now let's 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 see. We could probably use the sideboard without any problem, right? Um, so what we expect then is that um, QF e to the minus i h p QI is then an integral e to the i s of q dq or dq of t. Sometimes I'm going to write this as q of t. And for the case that we're talking about, the quantum mechanics of one dimension, which is the simplest case, we have here m over 2 with the dot squared minus v of q uh, dt. And we can think of this as an integral zero to t of L of Q and Q dot dt. So Q is S of Q is the action functional. And it, I, I'm calling it a functional because it maps a function, Q of t, into a number, S of Q, which is the action for the process Q of t. Yeah. Um, is it possible to do path integration where, like, you hold both the initial and the final points fixed, but then you can vary the, um, like, the different paths can have different amounts of time to get there? Different paths what? Uh, can have different amounts of time. So one particle oh. can take t. That's interesting. Um, I've never thought about that. And um, Why don't we talk about it after class? I mean, it just, I just had not thought about it at all. It actually is fun to think about time. Um, and um, one, one thing that's really amusing is to imagine that, um, imagine what physics would be like if you had two time variables. Two dimensions of time? Yes, yeah. or higher dimensional time. Or multiple dimensions of space. Well, yeah, multiple dimensions of space is sort of, sort of obvious. But not, not really, but it's, 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 it's less jarring than having multi-dimensional multi time. That's one of the ideas that I wanted to explore at some point. Got to talk around it. Some music. All right, so. What we're doing here is we're thinking about all the paths that go from well, one to the other. And I, or, I already have, have, actually I'm repeating myself. I did this in the last lecture. Um, so I think I'm, I think I'm going to skip to how to approximate this. Um, so let's, um, remember I said, when is this amplitude big? Well, this amplitude is, will be big if there's a path that goes from QI to QF 
something like that, that is stationary. In other words, it's a classical path. And a classical path, then, is one such that the action from a small departure is the action plus something that's of the order of delta q, integral delta q squared dt. In other words, the first order change is zero. And um, so let's, let's look at how that happens. Suppose we're considering L to be m over 2 q dot squared minus v of q, then s of q plus delta q is an integral dt, 0 to t, m over 2 q dot plus delta q dot squared minus v of q plus delta q. And so the first term there is an integral 0 to t dt, m over 2 q dot squared minus v of q. And um, the next term is an integral 0 to t m q dot, the time derivative of q dot minus v prime of q delta q integrated dt. And then there are higher order terms. Uh, then there's this term order delta q squared and then even higher order terms. Now, the point is that in general, this second term can up here, because of the i, you have something that is this term, remember it's i, and this really the units of action are energy times time, they're the same as the units of h or h bar, and so there's really an h bar in the denominator here. So when, when the action functional is uh, such that this term here, um, is of the order of h bar, then it can it can really um, wash out the first term, and so the, the 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 you'll get a dominant contribution when this term vanishes, and if we integrate by parts, the condition that that term vanish is that the integral zero to t of m q double dot minus m q double dot minus v prime delta q dt should be zero. So this is the condition that this first order variation vanished. I just integrated by parts and I dropped the surface terms because the um, because these are paths that all go from qi to qf. So delta q has to vanish here delta q of 0 is 0, and over here, delta q of t is 0. So these are pad, these delta q's are paths that go from 0 to 0. And so there's no uh, surface term when you integrate by parts. And so the statement that this first order term vanishes is just the standard thing that this is equal to minus v prime, which is the standard equation of classical physics in one dimension. Um, okay, so now the question is, um, so now, how, how, what's the story? Well, the story is then that the classical path will dominate, um, and, uh, and when will it dominate? Well, it will dominate as long as um, the action is much bigger than h bar, because then this term, when the action is much bigger than h bar, this term, when it's non-zero, will be will wash out the first term. In other words, uh, you, you, 
this term that is of first order, if it doesn't vanish, um, it can it can wash out the first term. And so how do we basically, see? I'm not sure, how do we see I'm not sure I'm explaining this really well. But the, let me give you the bottom line. The bottom line is that if the action is of the order of h bar or smaller, then anything goes and this approximation doesn't work. On the other hand, if the action is bigger than h bar, then, um, then you expect that this classical path will really dominate and the classical path is characterized by this thing vanishing. Okay, you had a question or an observation? Um, how do we see that the first term is going to be washed out by the second term? Well, you see, what we've got is we've got this path integral here, and we can uh, we can approximate it by expanding about some fixed path, and um, if it's a all right, let's put it this way: if it's a if it's um, not the classical path, then, then, so the then if it's not the classical path, you see this term here isn't going to be zero. Because you can find, because this term won't vanish, and consequently delta Q delta T, this is going to be of the, this whole integral is going to be the order of T times delta Q whatever we, we call this, so the norm of the function delta Q times T is going to be the magnitude of this thing, and then it, co it contributes e to the i T norm of delta Q divided by h bar. And so if T times delta Q is several mul multiples of h bar, then as you integrate over all possible delta Qs, the thing just washes out. You get all possible phases there with essentially equal amplitude, and you just get a blur. Whereas, if there's a path such that, uh, if there's a path that satisfies this equation, then if you expand about that path, uh, this first order term vanishes, and so the action is, um, the action is predominantly this first order term where this is the classical trajectory. So that's the idea. And so in fact this leads to an important approximation that's used a great deal in quantum mechanics and the analogous approximation is used in quantum field theory. In quantum mechanics, it's basically called the WKB approximation. So let me, let me get back to it again. So if we have a classical path, which is one, so M, the classical double dot is minus partial B partial Q classical set. Then we have that S of Q is going to be, I think it's clear from what I wrote there, it's going to be S of Q classical plus something that's going to look like this, an integral 0 to T, M over 2, delta Q dot squared, minus a half B double prime delta Q squared dt plus higher order term, and I'll just write it like that. Is that all right? Is that... So I mean, I've done that expansion. I just, I, I guess what I didn't do explicitly over there was I didn't say what the what the second order term is. The second order term, of course, is m over 2 double dot squared, and then it's the second order term 
in the expansion of V of Q plus delta Q. And that's just minus a half V double prime of Q times delta Q squared. Okay, so if a classical path exists then QF E minus I H T QI is E to the I of course S of Q D Q and then this is E to the I S of Q classical, the first order term vanishes. The next term is I 0 to T M over 2 delta Q dot squared minus a half B double prime delta Q squared DT DQ. But on the other hand, Q is Q classical, which is fixed, plus delta Q. So DQ is D delta Q. And so this effectively is, and this is, this is independent of delta Q. And so this thing is E to the I S of Q classical times the path integral of e to the i, well, actually this is a mistake now that I see in the notes. It's true for, it's true for quadratic, it may not even be true for quadratic, so I'm going to have to rewrite page 13 here. Fortunately, I didn't post it yet. Um, so this, I'm going to have to rewrite this. This is just integral 0 to t m over 2 delta q dot squared minus a half v double prime of q classical delta q squared dt. And now we say this is d delta q. And what are these delta q's? These are paths that go from 0 to 0 because q is q classical plus delta q. Q of zero is Q classical of zero plus delta Q of zero. And this has to be QI. And Q of big T is Q classical of big T uh, plus delta Q of big T. And this has to be QF. But on the other hand, Q classical, this is Q classical of zero, and this is Q classical of T. So the classical path goes from QI to QF. And uh, the, every path goes from QI to QF. So delta Q of zero is zero, and also delta Q of T is zero. So this is an integral over all loops that go from zero to zero. So this is a path integral over loops. That means that this approximation is, in other words, the approximation of the amplitude is e to the i, the action of the classical path, times something that we can call L of capital T. It's independent of QI and QF because this is an integration over um, it's an integration over loops. Now actually, now that I think about it, that's not strictly true in general. It's true, it's true if V doesn't involve Q initial or QF, but um, there can be some dependence on Q initial or QF in, in this term here. So I spoke too quickly. In, 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 a, in, in a quadratic case, though, it is actually independent of QI and QF. Yeah, let me 
let me put you in trouble. But what's the um, yeah, but I mean, L, L of T is also like it's dependent upon the parameters, right, in the system. Like well, it's it's a, it's a, it certainly depends upon the mass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but if it's if the thing is quadratic, then you see uh, V double prime is a constant if it's quadratic. So constant of the system, but so it's independent of QI and QF. So this is this is L of T in the quadratic case. Actually, in the quadratic case, this thing is not an approximation; it's exact. So in the quadratic case, so let me let me let me go to the quadratic case. So for the quadratic case, there are no higher order terms because there isn't anything higher than the second derivative of V. Chair there. All right. And um, in the quadratic case, V double prime of Q classical is just some constant. It's independent of Q classical. And uh, so this is strictly, it, and the, since there's no approximation, this is actually an exact result for the quadratic case. For the non-quadratic case, the approximation, what we have is an approximation. So in general, what we have then is that, is that the amplitude minus i h t q i is approximately e to the i s of q classical times some function of time, but um, it could involve actually because of this, this integral here and all the higher order terms, it could involve q classical. Yeah. Um, you just clarify what you meant by it being an integral over loops. Good question. Uh, the point is that all of the paths go from QI to QF. So all the paths do that. Let, let's say this is the classical path. And now then the delta Q path would be sort of like this, or it could be like that. In other words, the alternative paths. But all of the paths have to go from QI to QF because we're talking about, uh, you see, the very first Q would be a delta function here. In other words, it would be Q0, QF. Well, this is delta of Q0 minus QF. And the last one, uh, QI. And the last one would be QF, QN, say, and this would be delta of QF minus QN. Okay? So that's why uh, all of the paths go from QI to QF, and so the delta Qs, delta Q of 0 is 0, delta Q of big T. That means it's their their loops. So, in general, what you've got is the amplitude is a phase factor that's e to the i, the classical action over h bar, and then a loop integral. But why should it involve q classical? I'm sorry. For the L, why is it a function? Oh, because, because what we have left here, all right, so let me, let me say what the thing actually is by maybe putting in, I mean, in this case, it, 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 it's because this loop integral in general is an integral over delta Q, m over 2 delta Q dot squared. That doesn't involve Q classical, but this term is minus half V double prime of Q classical 
times delta Q squared. So delta Q, so Q classical comes in this way. And in the higher order term, it comes in. Again, if V is a complicated function of Q, if it's quadratic, then it's independent. The second derivative is uh, a constant. So it's independent of Q classical. And in that case, the thing is exact. All right. All right, let me give the example of a free particle, which in a sense we've already, we already did last time. say then as an exact result is QF, I mean, this is not very profound, but anyway, it is exact. Minus I H0, here I'm saying H0 is P squared over 2 and One also often puts a zero if the, if the uh, system is soluble. You say, well, this is our H0, and then the way it's something that's more complicated. Anyway, uh, this is then exactly EBI S of Q classical um, times some L of T. And so here it's E to the I uh, M over 2 QF minus QI squared over T times some L of T, some loop integral. Now, it was a trick for, for, for at least guessing what the loop integral is. And namely that what you know is you know that L of T, well, you know that in the limit T going to zero, QF E to the minus I H zero T QI, this has to be delta of QF minus QI. So it has to be a delta. Now, Dirac's delta function uh, has many, many, many representations. The one that's useful here is to say the delta of x is a limit t goes to <coughs> 0, m over 2 pi i h bar t the one half e to the i m x squared over two h bar t. So I put in the h bar. And so what do we have? 
This factor here, you see, corresponds to this factor here. So to get the delta function, this L of t has to be this. So we set L of t equal to m over 2 pi i h bar t square root. So. Now, um, at this point, this is a guess rather than a proof because um, I haven't really done the loop integral. And secondly, um, uh, this is what L of t has to be in the limit. Oh, this is t. In the limit, t goes to 0. But um, it could be multiplied by a factor that goes to 1 as t goes to 0. On the other hand, you can verify that the thing is right. So in other words, let me give you the answer. By the way, we're also going to do canonical quantization. Okay, we're not going to stay with it. We're not going to, we're not going to abandon canonical quantization. Yeah, shouldn't you have a negative sign of the S of uh, 1 over i is minus i. We're back here under the integral. Um, I'm sorry, where? From the integral? The integral, a lot of integrals. All right, <laughs> oh, is, is it of? The integrals with respect to little t. Oh, okay, sorry, never mind, never mind. Right. I thought it was Keep a the All right. <laughs> All right. Okay, we're recording. Yep. Oh, well, let me let me write down. What, let, let me write down. Then our guess is q f e minus i equal d. I is um, square root of m over two pi i h bar at e to the i m q f minus two i squared over two big t. All right. Now we can verify that this is exactly right. Um, just by using ordinary quantum mechanics. Namely, this thing is actually qf e to the minus i p squared over 2m minus t. So we can insert the identity operator in the form of an integral dp prime p prime d prime qi. And so this, the p prime, is an eigenstate of p, an eigenvalue p prime. And so this is an integral d e to minus i p prime squared big T over 2m qf p prime prime dp prime, prime and now we know what these are from elements of quantum mechanics that throw out square roots of p prime and then e minus i p prime squared big T over 2m plus i qf minus qi p prime but this is an integral that we've seen. In fact, it was on this board, but I erased it. This, in fact, that's, that's the value of that integral. Um, so, and in fact, that's what we used in our um, derivation, our original derivation of the path. We did the integral explicitly using one of our Gaussian integral forms. In fact, the integral is uh, on page 7 of the notes. I wrote it as 1.7, but I, I'm going to be dropping it 1. 
All right, any questions? All right. So this is the basis, as I said of before, of the WKB approximation, namely that the, the an amplitude of quantum mechanical process is the exponential of classical action times something or other that's uh, simple. All right. Let me now, I'll, I'll use that board just for a minute, remind you of what uh, the action is for an electromagnet. Let, let me first of all say, we can go, of course, from, I've been talking about quantum mechanics in one dimension. We can go to three space dimensions quite easily, right? We just, obvious, uh, the, the analogous result, I let me do the analogous result for three dimensions here. It is that this thing then is QF e to the minus i p vector squared over 2m big T qi. That is then m over 2 pi i r t 3 halves. And now it's e to the i, oh, there's an h bar, I think. I'm guessing that it's here, but. Um, e to the i m q f minus q i vector squared over 2t h bar. Let's, let's uh, do the units. If we put another t here and a t here, then this is a time derivative squared times a mass. That's an energy. And yes, I've got it right. So this is the case for three dimensions. So now let's go over that board and uh, consider electrodynamics. Um, I'm thinking of a situation of Bohm Aharonov effect. This is something that caused a sensation, I don't know, 50 years ago, I don't remember. of a particle of mass m, charge q, in an electromagnetic field, um, where there are no other charges, and uh, consequently the, the scalar potential is zero. It's an integral from x1 to x2, mb plus q vector potential, Oh, that's a bad choice, Q. Let me say E. Dot DX. Um, So, um, and then V D T is D X. In any event, I'm not going to use this term and the standard form for, uh, oh, and, all right, I think this is right. It might be a minus sign somewhere, but let's go. Okay, what's the experimental setup? You've got a source of charged particles. You've got a cylinder where the magnetic field is not equal to zero. 
magnetic field is zero outside the cylinders, and you let the particles go around the cylinders and show up at a detector here. Here is detector. Um, now, what will be important and will show up in the detector is the phase difference of the two amplitudes. They're completely out of phase. You get um, uh, the amplitudes completely cancel. You have to add the amplitudes, and so the, they're way out of phase. Then it's not zero. So. What is delta S divided by H bar? Well, that will be an integral, and here what I'm saying is the integral from here to there, and then back again this way. So it's a loop integral in space.
and it was paid for. So but where are you changing, I mean, what is the purpose of changing into this imaginary time frame? That, I, I think that this business of changing to imaginary time frames is semi nuts. Okay. I don't think I'm, I'm giving you this simply as what 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 Z says and what most books say. This, in other words, the actual lingo is that we're not computing this for real time. We're computing this thing just e to the minus beta h. We're computing matrix elements of this. So in other words, we would be computing, say, QF e to the minus beta h qi, something like that. And now what's, inter what's interesting about this? As, as t goes to 0, beta goes to infinity, and this becomes a projection operator on the ground state. So in other words, this is... Um, wait, 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 sorry. As t goes to 0, beta goes to infinity, the direct proportion. Right. This is... Uh, I'm, I'm not emphasizing e to the minus h over kt. So as you let t go to zero, oh, temperature. temperature go to zero. Oh, sorry, time. you thought I meant time. All right. Okay, so we're get another chocolate anyway. Um, okay. So what what is this? Whether you insert a complete set of states. I in states of the Hamiltonian. And what happens is you take t going to 0. Well, this gives you a sum over i um, e to the minus ei over kt qf ei ei qi. And now as t goes to 0, temperature goes to zero, this thing goes to e to the minus e zero. Well, I've got this embarrassing uh, k zero here. It's, it's um, but what you get is qf, the ground state, e zero. So this projects out the ground state. It's a projection operator on the ground state. Um, and, or to, to put it differently, uh, e to the minus h over kt. Right, let, let, me, let me rewrite this to make it sensible. Limit, t goes to 0, e to the minus h over kt is e to the minus e0 in its limb t goes to 0 e to the minus e0 over kt uh, e0 e0 so it's a projection operator not on the ground state but on the ground state times e to the minus e0 over k that's what, what, what's actually uh, literally true. I was being a little bit sloppy. So, in other words, if, you, if you're in any sort of a quantum theory and you want to understand what's going on in the ground state, e to the minus, you, 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 you can use, you can, it, it pays to look at e to the minus beta h and then look at that for large beta and that will tell you information about the grand state of the theory. And this is particularly important in quantum field theories or in, obviously, low temperature physics. In quantum field theory of, um, say, particle physics, well, what is the nature of the vacuum? The vacuum is, I mean, the lowest state of the theory is very complicated and nobody really understands what it is. Um, the, the most natural explanation is dark energy. 
um, is that the ground state of the, whatever the true theory is, the ground state of the theory has um, positive energy density. It's small, but it's not zero. And it's, it's positive, and that's, it was big enough so the last four billion years or so it's it been causing the expansion of the universe to accelerate. Um, um, yeah, your energy density by constant. I'm sorry, say that again. Can you just shift your energy density by constant? You, you can in an ordinary problem, but whenever you're dealing with gravity, uh, gravity responds to energy. And so um, the, the energy density of the universe, its actual value, uh, influences Einstein's equations. So in every, you're right, every theory except gravity, you can uh, set your, your, your zero of energy wherever you please. But when you're dealing with gravity, you can. Any other questions? All right, we're sort of at the end of the hour. What I'm going to do next time at the beginning is just run through, but I guess quickly, the path integral derivation for this case, even minus beta h. That would be um, simple. And um, then we can uh, go to, we did three, three dimensions over there. We can go to n dimensions. And then from n dimensions, we can go to quantum field theory. It's really no change at all, really. The hard part of has the word we finished the hard part of the Alright, might as well turn it.